change. Okay? The thing, the <coughs> thing that uh, all of us are not uh, like ready for change. Like as human beings, I think when whenever we talk about change, people don't want to adapt to it right away. Right. No, I'm sure everything takes time. Like a couple of a couple of days ago, when X, can I can I start from here? Okay, a couple of days ago when we met on the airplane while we were coming back to Nepal. Yes. Uh, there was one thing that I was noticing, and I have to I have to say this. Right before we took off, I was just looking at you, and instantly you could go ahead and like just relax, and you probably fell asleep or you got into some kind of state of like relaxed, you know mood and pro- most probably you slept for a bit as well uh some i can't do that uh-huh. like for me to <laughs> adapt to a new place i okay. need a little bit more time right maybe with more practice i'll get better at it but i was looking at you and i was amazed that you could instantly adapt to a new environment uh how d- like am i getting am, am i getting it right that day you no can- i think that's uh, somewhat right yeah you know what uh, happens to me <clears throat> and particularly is that uh, i sort of like uh, do not find uh, any strange place or any unfamiliar moments or any unfamiliar space yeah it's kind of like a and finding very much home and uh, no matter where i am yeah and uh, no matter in what situation i am in so of course sometimes like then uh, in the aeroplane I must be very exhausted after traveling from Davos yeah and uh, to Zurich to Dubai and then <laughs> <laughs> so like a red eye and a flight that may have helped a little bit but uh, you're right uh, and uh, people are asking me always wow Rinpoche, you have uh, such a big and uh, vision to accomplish a peace destination for everyone and such a big project and you must be interest, stressed and you must be really depressed uh, because uh, COVID and financial situation around the world, blah, blah, blah. You know, they just comment like that. Yeah. And I said, no, 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 not at all because I do whatever I can, but when I sleep, I sleep like a baby. <laughs> <laughs> let's start from that. that. Let's start from that. Let's start from, I kind of want to start from that itself. Uh, all the pro- <laughs> as human beings we have so many problems so we have so many problems every single day and one problem uh, okay let me let me say it from my perspective wake up in the morning i wake up in the morning and i have tasks to complete get up in the morning uh, make the bed make the coffee do this task do that task go exercise you know come to the office t- tasks after tasks after task every single day constantly we fulfill the task our brain is going to go ahead and release a chemical that's going to make us happy hopefully and then we work on towards our task number two sometimes we might have to completely stop and take a break what do you suggest people who are always on the run mm-hmm. like the same thing that we discussed about right now people who are continuously working continuously doing one task after the other don't you think we have to take a break don't you think we have to take a sp- <clears throat> even a small amount of break from time to time yes uh, i think you need to take a break uh, for 24/7 huh. i don't think you can take small amount of break okay if you really want to relieve yourself from stress what i mean by that is that uh, it's not so important to identify with the task. So that's the key. So when you're identifying with this task, the task becomes chore. So therefore, you are not able to truly integrate in that very moment, whatever you are doing, right? So more important, what you need to identify with is your own life. Because after all, your life that is, you know, flowing every moment like a river right the energy or whatever you want to call it that energy is constant the energy the process is where we need to really enjoy and relish this we call it preciousness of human life or uh-huh. we call it having a great time or 
whatever label you want to name and uh, want to have it, you can have the label that you like. Uh-huh. But most important is not to identify with the task as something that you need to accomplish because nobody is giving you tasks you know, to really accomplish unless you want to accomplish, right? Yeah. So it's your mind that is so like a, you know, making you you know, do a mind that is you know, allowing you to be free from doing anything. So in my mind, so like uh, if you don't look at a task, it's just like a process that just like, what will you do if you don't do any of this work? And you might be getting massage whole day, yeah. right? And uh, on the laying on the beach whole day. But then that is also, you know, where you will be killing your time. True. Right? So in a way, I don't think we need to look at it as like, okay, vacation is this, task is this, as kind of separate. That is sort of like a, then giving us the wrong, so like a, you know, goal. You uh-huh. know? So then, which is not achievable after all. Huh. So in my mind, uh, I always not, don't look at it as like a, I'm doing something special job or anything like that. Right now, when I'm working and traveling all over the world to, you know, raise awareness of universal peace or promote Nepal, and whatever I'm doing is just part of me. It's like having a great time doing it because I see nothing better for me to do than that. So my breath, as I breathe, I felt like, okay, so my breath is meaningful. Wow. 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 <laughs> wow. <laughs> breath is meaningful. Can I, can, I, can I steal that from you? <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I talk for a living and uh, I hope my breath is a little bit meaningful uh, as well. Definitely. You know, you know, you know, when I you know, first wow. uh, met you, you know, I- even though I didn't know much about uh, your background at all, but just like the way you are carrying yourself, I was very impressed. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm I'm so I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful. And I apologize. We couldn't talk much that day because oh, no, we were both tired. <laughs> I instantly went to sleep on the floor. Me too. Uh, <laughs> you don't know this ex. Uh, I met uh, I met his uh, evidence at the plane the other day when I was coming back from uh, Dubai, and uh, we we're just talking just for a bit. Right. And we're both so tired. We're tired. Uh, let me jump into this and ask you how how was Davos? How was the economic forum? And uh, why were you there? Well, if you don't mind me. <clears throat> no, yeah. not at all. Uh, actually, uh, before, you know, two weeks before the Davos, I didn't have any particular plan to go to Davos. Actually, for a long time, I was thinking that Davos might be a good uh, place for yeah. me to, you know, like raise awareness. Because uh, after all, I always uh, was thinking that uh, peace, world peace and world economy yeah. are the you know, two sides of one coin in a way. Yeah. So then, two weeks before, a uh, few gentlemen and a uh, few people, they requested that I come to Davos. Yeah. And then, of course, uh, I'd never been to Davos, and uh, I never had any connection with anybody in business. You know, I was living in a monastery in the Himalayas, and uh, what I will do? You know, I never did a one single dollar of business in my life, so, <laughs> so it's not that, you know. But uh, I was told always that there are great many people who are influential, you know, in a, you know, world you know, finance and economics. So people are saying there are many open-minded people. Uh-huh. So anyway, then uh, there was one uh, gentleman named Rich, and, uh, and uh, his colleague uh, approached me and, and said, okay, uh, my boss wants to talk to you. And, uh, can you have a you know, time with him on Zoom? Uh, on Monday, I said, sure, I'll make my time. And then they called me on Zoom, and we had about you know, 10, 12 minutes you know, meeting on the Zoom. And his rich said, you know, we want an, uh, his eminence uh, to Davos. And, uh, and John, do everything, whatever you can, to arrange everything that he needs to do here and uh, and if you, he can come sooner, the better. So then we just got the ticket quickly and, uh, and arrange. And of course, you know, we had to take a different route yeah. to go through Paris, to yeah. Paris, to Zurich, then to Davos. It was a little longer trip for me, but, you know, that was worth it. And once I reached there, it was amazing, you know, that uh, as I reached Zurich train station, uh, we had to take train to you know, Davos. Uh, suddenly there is a uh, two... There are many people, but two pe- uh, person 
One is a lady, one is a gentleman. Uh, they are from, I guess, uh, BBC uh -huh. uh, version of uh, German television. Yeah. So they had caught it in Brussels and and they asked me where I'm going and I said I'm going to Davos. So, so maybe <laughs> there was a surprise to them. And then uh, they were asking me, uh, uh, when did you get up? And I said, uh, 5 a.m. And uh, when do you meditate? I said, uh, right away I get up, I meditate. And then they wanted to have an interview uh, to come to my you know, bedroom and uh, uh, take the, you know, you know, television, you know, crew there and yeah. shoot what I'm doing. And then they explain about uh, why I'm in the Davos and what is my vision and so on and so forth. And I thought that was a, uh, quite interesting because uh, yeah. that was his idea. And then uh, they never had a uh, spiritual master, a lama, uh, in Davos and wearing like this, yeah. <laughs> you know. So it was you know, quite a, intriguing for them. And then I, you know, said, sure, you know, why not? Uh, so next day, you know, morning, you know, Sunday morning, Davos starts on Monday, so we reached Saturday. Yeah. First Sunday morning, my interview was with them, and they had 10 million you know, subscribers wow. and who are listening to, you know, their television shows. I thought that was auspicious to start, right? Yeah, it definitely was. So then you know, once we were there, and they, you know, I landed in the center of Davos. It's called... Uh, hotel Europa, uh, Europe Hotel. So in that, uh, really, everything is happening, and uh, this uh, group of people, and uh, they have this penthouse. They call penthouse, but that is like a very big house with about 10, 15 bedrooms and, uh, you know, living rooms and kitchen, everything. And uh, I was hosted there. Uh -huh. So later I found out that that is the epicenter of Davos. Wow, interesting. So like everybody, senators and congressmen and you know, billionaires and multimillionaires, all, yes, exactly. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they just, they just come there and you know, they have meetings. And so I didn't have to go to so many places and uh, I'm able to have meetings there. But once they realized that I am in Davos, then many different uh, platforms open up for me and yeah. they asked me to come to this panel and please talk to Crypto Monday and please talk to technology versus humanity and please come to F Forbes you know, you know, news, you know, like a party and they asked me to come to the Arabian night wow. to do the blessing. And so and I was uh, more busy than those who have planned <laughs> for one year. So it was quite interesting for me. I'm glad, I'm happy. <laughs> I want to ask you something, a uh, follow-up on this. Did they all know that you were you visited from Nepal? Yes, that that's and I come from Himalayas. Yeah. I come from Nepal. I'm you know establishing this peace destination in Lumbini, the birthplace of Buddha, where Queen Maya Devi gave birth. And Nepal is the most peaceful country and the best weather and best tourist place. And Nepal people Nepali people are most hospitable and peace loving. That's Constantly, I'm you know, saying to them, and they all want to come to Nepal now. Did, Many they, did they know about Nepal? Did some of them know about Nepal, or did some of them heard about the country Nepal for the first time? No, actually, many people said, and I wanted to go to Nepal for so long. That's the one in my bucket list that I wanted to really go. So many people. And, uh, and I was just joking and saying, you found the best tour guide now. <laughs> I'm really glad. When you when you see Nepal, what's the first thing that comes to uh, leaders, multi-billionaires? Uh, what comes to their mind? What what do you what do you think they know? Is it Everest? Is it Buddha? Like what what comes to their mind? I think uh, they know about uh, trekking and hiking, uh, and uh, they know of Nepal as most pristine place to really go into nature. Wow. And they really want to experience this very meditative and powerful spiritual experience. And this is what I think you know, they were looking for. And of course, you know, where was Buddha born? Buddha born in Nepal and so on and so forth. I'm not so sure they are very much aware of it. Yeah. Now more and more, of course, we are educating them. So yeah. therefore, they can hear from us. But uh, besides that, I'm not so they're as knowledgeable, you know, because... Uh, people are, you know, always looking for something for themselves first, right? So then, then especially those coming to Davos, 
they are the real movers and shakers of the world. Of the world. And they want to experience something that they cannot find anywhere else. And I was very happy to tell them that if you come to Nepal, yeah. you don't have to go anywhere else. <laughs> so they were quite intrigued by that. Wow, 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 wow. I'm, 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 I'm really glad. I'm really glad. I'm really glad you went to Dallas. How long were you there for? How many days? I was there for seven days, yeah. actually. You yeah. know, I went throughout. Yeah, throughout. I was throughout. Throughout was so busy. Yeah. I could not leave. So until the last minute. Yeah. And we were there. And then not only that, uh, Mayor of Davos yeah. and uh, Mrs. Uh, Hilda Schwab. Mm-hmm. who founded the Davos World Economic Forum. And they all, you know, met with me and, and they gave me lots of opportunity to talk to them. And then local people and the Davos citizens, they're all asking me to please come back and we really need you to promote peace and we want to be associated yeah. with peace, you know, not just economics. You know, so how can you come back and what can we do so even you know, so we had many discussions, and uh, even after Davos and the meetings were ended, it was interesting. I mean, it was really touching because people really are very welcoming. Wow, that's really good to know. Let's let's get started. I want to talk a little bit about Lumini, and I want to talk about the sanctuary that you're building as well. That you were giving me a gist on the airplane that uh, we discussed about. Can you tell everybody a little bit about the Universal uh, Peace Sanctuary? In Lumini, that, you, that you're working <coughs> with? Mm, yes. Uh, the Universal Peace Sanctuary is uh, my pure vision, uh, where I felt that we need a destination for every peace lovers around the world, uh-huh. for every race, for every color, every creed, every gender, uh, for believers and non-believers alike. It's not a religious per se. Okay. It's not a political you know, center, but a spiritual for humanity as a whole, the most inclusive place. If you think about it, if you read uh, in the history book as such, uh, until today, since the beginning of civilization, there isn't any place that is totally dedicated to peace, and that is the most inclusive place. Hmm. So I realized that for many, many uh, thousands of years, great religious leaders, uh, great saints and enlightened ones, they played a great role in serving humanity. And uh, for that, we can see today from the relics such as Jerusalem and Bethlehem, like Mecca and Medina, Ram Janam Bhumi, Bodh Gaya, Golden Temple. You know, all these things are wonderful, special places you know, for all religious followers, right? True. But in 21st century, I do not find these sacred places as, as exclusive as we need to find and we need to have. Because today... Not necessarily millennials and Gen Zs are following any religious in a really earnest ways, right? True. But it's still people looking for peace and happiness and trying to find the purpose of life. So for that, I realized that it is very important for us to have a real spiritual pilgrimage a site where everybody can come and uh, worship and uh, you know enjoy by being themselves in a spiritual sanctuary. Uh-huh. So then I realized that, uh, you know, like uh, Lumbini is such a special place because uh, Queen Maya Devi, she really sacrificed her life yeah. and, uh, by, you know, really giving birth to her child. And I thought that was really amazing for her to take role as a mother seriously because prior to that, she was already told that she will not live to raise her child if she gives birth to her child. <clears throat> but still she had a courage. She had a conviction. So I feel that all mothers in the past, uh-huh. you know, of course, Maya Devi's life story is recorded in the history book, so we know it by reading history books. But all the billions and billions of mothers sacrificed the same way and uh, gave birth to their children. And today, again, millions and millions right this very minute are giving birth and sacrificing you know, their lives to express unconditional love like our own mothers, right? True. So in the future, same thing. So therefore, I come to realize that uh, symbolically, the mother's love is the closest unconditional love that we can experience and we can feel and, and we can relate. Uh-huh. So in a way, what I want to say to the world is if we want to build a peace, lasting peace in the world and lasting peace within, and that peace must be based on unconditional love. So therefore, 
I decided to choose the Lumbini as a place to really build this universal peace sanctuary. So my and a non-profit charitable organization in America, uh -huh. which I founded in 1989, and we requested land to the Nepali government uh, through, you know, Lumini Development Trust. So we were very able, to, very lucky to be able to obtain this piece of land, and we did everything that we can to make sure that uh, we use this land for Nepal, for Nepalese, and for humanity as a whole to become this most meaningful place. So we did a lot. We have done uh, construction for MEVP building, which is completed now. You started in 2013, I 2013. believe. 2013. Yeah. And in between, we had a little bit uh, obstacles, like COVID is one thing. And of course, you know, earthquake, earthquake <laughs> is another thing. And, and uh, when you're working with the uh, government, you need to have a little bit more time because sometimes it doesn't go as smooth as you wish because it takes longer, longer, longer. But uh, everybody in, uh, cooperated with us very well. So we are very lucky to have... So you're doing it through Buddha Field? Uh, uh, RY Inc. is our organization. Got it. So RY Inc. has a Buddha Field, uh, 50 acres of land in New York. And uh, this is the one in, uh, in Lombini where it is you know, our organization's charitable act. So just give a gist of, let's say, by when is it going to be finished? And let's say if I'm one of the visitors, visitor, then what should I expect? You see, I think right now we have done the piling of the peace sanctuary. So now to do the foundation, we need a quite a bit of fun mm -hmm. to really accomplish it. Because we cannot do it piece by piece. We have mm -hmm. to do the whole thing you know, together. Yeah. So that's what we are working on. And whatever we can do, we did the reflection pool around, and we are completely ready as far as drawing is concerned, and architecture engineering is concerned. We are all ready. So right, we're waiting for a little bit of time here because of the COVID, and the whole economy as such today is a very bad shape. Yeah. So I think uh, uh, we need to be a little bit patient, but uh, I think we will be able to see a great result. And uh, I think every Nepalese and, uh, can be very proud of this place. I think we will be offer something to the world uh, that, uh, okay, we will benefit ourselves as well as and, uh, everyone around the world. The rest of the world. Yeah. No, I, 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 I like it and I'm, I'm really excited for that. When was the first time you went to Lumini? Uh, do you remember that moment? That was many years ago, uh, probably 19... 87 when i was when i was being born <laughs> <laughs> so how old, i'm old you can tell now <laughs> old man. You, you don't look like old man you know that you don't look like old uh, man uh, how is lumini in 87 just to give people a perspective who yeah. are listening right now i have generation i i have millennials i've got gen z i have generation alpha right. listening to this right now so i just want to give them a perspective of how lumini was back in the day well, in uh, comparison to 1987, the Lumbini you see today is very big de development happened there. You know, already quite a bit uh, accomplishments there. Yeah. Uh, th those days, there's not even many taxis uh, to get to the places, you know, yeah. for e example. But right now, the Lumbini Bicascos and whatever they were able to do every year, yeah. I think they accomplish a lot. Uh, but I think this place is bigger than Central Park of New York. Yeah. So you know what Central Park looks like. So I think we have a task here to accomplish. And for that, it's still, I mean, it's not quick enough, you know, as far as development is concerned. But I think uh, we all work together. I think we can really achieve something uh, for everybody to be proud of. Yeah, that's true. And there's a reason why I, was, I asked you this. First time, first time I went to Lumini was was probably 11, 12 years ago, I believe, 12, 13 years ago, I believe, 2010, 2009 or 10 when I went inside. Mm -hmm. And it is one of the most peaceful places I've ever been to in my life. As soon as you cross the Ashoka pillar, as soon as you make that turn, right. where the tree is, where Lord Buddha was born, right. that whole, especially, I, I'll, point uh, i'll pick that place right it's such a special place as soon as you get there automatically your your heart feels so calm 
at least mine does. I don't know what's in that place. Maybe it's the energy. Uh, I don't know if uh, a lot of friends believe in that or not, but at least I do. It's such a beautiful energy, such a calming right. energy to that place. Uh, to friends who have been there, to friends who haven't been there, I just want to ask you, what is that energy? Why, why is it so calming, so peaceful? Would you describe it? No, I feel the same way. Anytime I reach there in Lumbini, yeah. I go early morning on a walking and uh, pay my respect to Maya Devi and Prince Siddharth who was born there. And then I sit right under the Bodhi tree there. And uh, just as long as I can, I just enjoy and uh, by just being myself there. So uh, I was thinking about the same thing. And I realized that, uh, you know, we all are born somewhere. Yeah. You know, I was born in the Himalayas. You were born in the Himalayas. Many were born in the America, Europe, wherever. I think, but there was a one person who was born there who truly found the purpose of his life. Yeah. So he was able to find this peace, serenity, complete you know, realization and wakefulness, right? So where one was able to achieve true freedom from suffering. So there, I feel like just being there, we come very close to experience, experiencing that happiness or that freedom from suffering uh -huh. where we do not feel that we need to do anything. Rather, by being there and associating with the quality of that and a particular person who was born there. Yeah. And uh, uh, later who, you know, now we know you know, as a Buddha or awakened one. So I think somehow we become very close to that energy. So our energy is experiencing that quality there. Yeah. So I think that is sort of like a self-empowerment that we are receiving and just by being on the ground. Sometimes we say that by being on a place where enlightened ones at an enlightenment or enlightened man was born, that place have a power to empower us. Wow. So I think you know, that sacred you know, place, uh, Lumbini Sacred Garden, is capable of empowering everybody who is stepping on that soul. So I think that is kind of like a uh, feeling I have. And I keep telling people that if whenever you are in Lumbini, and the way to pray to Buddha yeah. is to realize that, oh, life is very precious. If you realize life is very precious, yeah. that's it. Yeah, and uh, I don't even know how to explain it to you. Uh, I, I, I've tried to bought, I, I've bought a few things here. Mm -hmm. I've bought, uh, oh yeah, there you go. That small little thing is from right next to Maya Devi Temple. I bought it right uh -huh. outside Maya Devi Temple. So I, wherever I go, if I feel some kind of good energy, I try to go and buy something or bring mm -hmm. something back here right, so right. that I can <coughs> have a piece of energy within my sphere right here. Right, right. And the kind, the good energy that I feel there is, I can't even describe it. True. You know, and that's something so meaningful. Uh, in today's fast-moving world, like, uh, it's three seconds, right. uh, your eminence. There's people do not even have uh, more than three seconds of time to look or to ponder on something right. because they're constantly going to move, 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 move. Right. Uh, I know you've been practicing meditation for such a long time. I read that since four years old. Right. Right? So what advice would you want to go ahead and give to especially young friends who are in such a fast, fast, fast mode right now? What piece of advice would you give them? Well, I think we cannot stop that fast life and, uh, anymore. Okay. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, it's going to get even faster. So no matter how fast your life is, uh, the most important thing that I would like to really you know, ask everybody to think and feel is that this moment, no matter how fast you are, no matter what you are doing, 
this moment is more valid than anything else on this earth. Huh. So like, a, if you are able to realize that this moment is more valid than anything else, so if you are able to continuously realize that, that therefore, each moment is as valid as anything else. So even if you are running very fast, you are running very fast with a true purpose. And uh, you are running very fast by living life fully. Hmm. So in, in a way, you know, if you are looking for validation somewhere outside, and if you are chasing, then you are chasing after mirage to quench thirst. Of course, you will never be able to quench your thirst by chasing after mirage. But if you realize this moment is it, this moment is it, and if you are able to integrate in each moment, so okay, maybe some people are very capable of moving very fast yeah. and making most out of it each moment. But some people might need a little bit more time, so okay, I want to make sure this moment is truly valid, therefore I want to think about it I want to find peace in this very moment for as long as you can. Yeah. Well, uh, that is uh, one way, but again, you are moving a little bit slower. You're not able to catch the pace of everybody else. And maybe that's okay too, because yeah. you can ponder and you can relax. You can remain in this calm you know, state where you might also realize, oh, this moment is more valid than anything else. So bottom line is either way, whether you are running very fast or very slow, it is very important for us to realize that this moment is it. The moment, present moment, not the future, not the past. Yes. We love, we love thinking of the future and we sometimes go back to the past as well, all the time. Yeah, so when you are thinking of the past or when you are thinking of the future, so at that moment, even while you are thinking of the past and the future, if you realize that thinking itself, that moment, that thinking itself is valid, so you may think about the past once and you might ne never have to think again. True. You can true, true. cut through it. True, 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 true. <laughs> that, that, that is so true as well. Uh, you said that... Uh, Peace should be peace is fashionable. Let me yes. let me let me just go ahead and uh, just tweak it in my own way. <laughs> right, right. Uh, there is war in the world as well. True. There's always been war. Right. Before our lifetime, right. and there is uh, again. I do not want to say it, but I have to. There's always going to be war. Right. After our lifetime. Right. There's good. There's evil. Uh, you believe in that? No, I think uh, one thing we have to realize is yes. you know. War outside is not the only war. There's even bigger war is happening within. And uh, constantly we are fighting with ourselves, so to speak, because we have anger, we have jealousy, we have greed, we have selfishness. All these you know, thoughts, emotions, yeah. there are conflicts there all constantly. So my you know, understanding is that we need to find world peace through inner peace. Hmm. So unless we find world peace through inner peace, and no matter what we are planning, we are projecting. Hmm. So our projection therefore is limited because once we are limited, our projections are going to be limited as well. So in a way, you know, as far as I'm concerned, no matter what happens, our responsibility is to be able to handle it. Hmm. So if we have anger, we all have anger. It's not that nobody has anger. We have anger, but how we handle it? Are we able to handle anger quickly? Or anger is lingering around for months and years, and then we have a grudge against somebody, or then we go after that? Uh, or, or how you are really going to waste your time without finding validity in this very moment? Hmm. Right? So... Once you are able to handle situation, I think one good thing about us is we have ability to handle anything. As human beings. As human beings. Huh. So I sometimes call Buddha as the best manager ever. Because Buddha was able to manage 
his own anger, his own desire, his own hatred. Yeah. He was able to manage his life. Therefore, it's called his awakened one. You know, awakened from sleep of ignorance. When you are in the sleep of ignorance, you do not have wisdom, you don't have compassion, you don't have skill to really manage. Yeah. And your own you know, emotions and the feelings and what have you. But then how can you manage the world? So you will see the world as something horrible, right? Yeah. So if you are able to have this pure mind and you are able to see everything is pure. In that way, I think uh, it is very important for us to develop skills and ability to manage whatever is coming out from us, from our minds, all the thoughts and emotions. What would you like to go ahead and say to all the pessimists out there? How, how to turn them into slightly being optimistic? Well, and what I would like to you know, say to them is that you are guys are not pessimistic at all. You know, just like, you know, I just say you are not pessimistic at all because, you know, I don't believe in that. You know, what, what I, you know, would say is, you know, you are capable of, you know, living your life and you are very intelligent and being able to embrace your own intelligence you know, is it. Therefore, you know, don't even think of yourself as pessimistic, pessif- you know, Pessimist. Pessimist, and don't even think of you are involved in so like uh, negating anything because this is not the who you are. So I am very uh, practical in that sense. I, I would like to think that uh, we can empower everyone, we can encourage everyone, we can inspire everyone. And I think that is the quality of human you know, compassion. Uh, I apologize for saying this, but I know a lot of people who are not compassionate enough or who are not empathetic enough or who are not humble enough in this world who I know personally and um, I try to go ahead and try to be as much as I can but of course I have my own flaws as well as a human being um, and I'm trying to be better I'm sure there are a lot of people who are listening to us right now who are trying to be better in what they do not just with work but being a human being as well and sometimes they need a little bit of push a little bit of support, a little bit of maybe enlightenment. What would you like to go ahead and say to them who, who need a little bit of push? Yeah, I would uh, you know, say that uh, you need to find a little bit of clarity. Yeah. You know, that's all you need because uh, everyone doesn't have resources that we have been able to tap in. And uh, we need to be able to you know, create that resources for all of them uh, so that they will be also enriched. Because I think in a way... And if somebody is not compassionate right now, it's not that he or she is not going to be compassionate tomorrow because I think as soon as we are able to educate, we are able to guide them and inspire them, I believe that there is possibility for us to see everybody express their compassion, yeah. empathy and towards everyone. Because in a, in a way, there's no one who doesn't want to be happy. And no one you know, is there who wants to suffer. Yeah. So I think uh, we have to bring this knowledge and this clarity that suffering can be freed, suffering can be purified. So if we are able to purify, you know, if we don't have to suffer, I don't think nobody w- will suffer. You know, yeah. Nobody wants to suffer. But yeah. I think helplessly, yeah. and those who are not compassionate, those not empathetic, I think helplessly they are not compassionate, helplessly they are not empathetic. I don't think they are knowingly uncompassionate, knowingly not empathetic, I don't think it's absolutely possible at all because sun is shining all the time. There's no darkness in the sun. I mean, there's no darkness in the sun. Just because we don't see the sun at night doesn't mean the sun is not shining all the time. So I believe in the goodness of humanity. So therefore, I think it is very helpful that everybody will be able to rise to the occasion once they have this clarity. Yeah, yeah, uh, and I and I and I and I really and I really hope that it happens, especially, especially in Nepal, because at least I'll get I I I I, I want to say this that there's so much negativity around. Right. I'm not not I'm not going to just say Nepal, but around the world as well. Right. There's so much negativity. There's so much negativity, and you can see negativity in the palm of your hand. You don't even have to go far to look at negativity. You can just turn on your cell phone and there's so much negativity if you choose to look at that. How, sometimes I feel like, how do I tell people or how, even myself that how do I choose 
the positive aspects of it, to look at positive things, to listen to positive things and disregard negative things because it's very spicy, it's very juicy, it's very tasty. Negative things kind of tend to go ahead and lure you, you know, and they kind of uh, soak you in, they make you addictive. Uh, positive things sometimes are bland. They're not uh, so great, even with content, you know. Juicy content is always fun to watch. <clears throat> and when you try to go ahead and watch pure content, it's not that much fun, you know. So just diverting people slightly towards positivity and positive outlook. That is what we try to do through this podcast as well. Anything you'd like to say on this? I think uh, most important thing, you know, what I feel yeah. and uh, for everyone is that we must learn how to celebrate our life because our life is so precious. And this life you know, is impermanent as well. Yeah. So life is never going to pause for us. As I say, life is not a rehearsal. So we are not rehearsing to live tomorrow. So we must live now as a celebration, as a compassionate expression you know, from our heart. We have to truly find ways to integrate yeah. in every energy that we have you know, in front of us or within us or wherever it is. In a way, I feel it is very important for all of us, especially you know, from this part of the world, Himalayan you know, part of the world, which is a pristine, most beautiful part of the world and the plateau of the world and the highest mountain in the world. I think we must be able to lead the world and show to the world how pure we can be. And the way we are able to sustain in this purity, and if we can so like send that energy out to invite everybody to experience this, I think it is a great gift that we can give to the humanity and a great gift that we can give to ourselves because there's nothing more precious, nothing more precious than being able to celebrate each and every moment as if there is no next moment. I love it. I'm, I'm going to steal this too from you. I'm so stealing this from <laughs> you. The rehearsal part, I'm definitely going to steal this from you. I, I'm, and I'm saying it on air. <laughs> Life is definitely not a rehearsal, right? We get one chance. Actually, that's about it. Yeah, I think, you know, I mean, that's right now you and I am discussing this on this podcast. And uh, it's wonderful that we have this opportunity. But this moment that you and I am here is never going to come back. Never. Right? Yeah. So we are somehow you know, connected in a very deep way to just have conversation and here in your studio as well as we had a little bit of conversation in the plane. It just shows that human qualities and they can complement each other and complement everyone. True. Right? So uh, right now I'm enjoying so much and uh, sharing this moment with you and and uh, very honored to have this opportunity to be here. Likewise. So in, yeah. in that way, I feel constantly whenever I'm with anyone, and I really truly enjoy and being with everyone, you know, yeah. no matter and uh, how anyone projects. Yeah. And even if somebody projects their negative energy, uh, I don't feel negative about them. Of course, I react sometimes. Yeah. You know, not necessarily uh, the way they want me to react, but out of compassion out of real caring, because I don't feel that this person is really negative at all. Somehow, maybe I had to pay dues here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, you know, somehow, the you know, karmic dues or whatever it is. Yeah. So, okay, you just pay it, and then no more. You don't owe anything. <laughs> so, uh, no loan or no, you know, interest that you have to pay. Yeah. So, like, uh, in a way, you have to really keep your life very pure to your heart, because you are the one who must take care of yourself. Yeah. And even if Buddha shows up, I think, don't think Buddha can take care of me. Buddha will tell you, I teach you how to take care of yourself, so but yourself, you have to take care of yourself. Of yourself at the end of the day. <laughs> wow, wow. That, 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 is, that is so true. That is so true. That, no, I, completely, I completely agree with you. That is, that is so true. At the end of the day, you have to end up uh, taking care of yourself. Uh, I was reading upon you and... Uh, uh, he said there was a term called the chosen. You, you were chosen when you were very young. As a reincarnation. Reincarnation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Would, you, would you elaborate on that? Just make me understand how that works. Uh, 
No, I think uh, in a way everyone is, you know, an incarnation of some sort because you know, we, as long as we believe in uh, past life and uh, next life, so we are incarn reincarnated you know, somehow. But in our Himalayan Buddhist tradition, uh, as Buddha himself was able to predict, like he was saying that uh, after I am uh, no more uh -huh. here, uh, even greater than me, you know, who will be able to uh, bring the teaching of Vajrayana and uh, most secret mm -hmm. in the teachings, uh, will be uh, born as my reincarnation. Yeah. So at that time, then as was Buddha told, you know, Padmasambhava as a reincarnation was born, and then he spread teachings all over the Himalayas. Mm -hmm. So that tradition came from the Buddha himself and uh, until today, and especially the Himalayan region, and uh, we have this tradition uh, intact. So in a way, this tradition is very profound because great enlightened masters, uh, when they pass away, uh -huh. their legacy of serving humanity, serving his students, continued yeah. uh, by the next reincarnation who is trained, who is groomed, and after recognize, yeah. and to carry on this profound activity. So today in Tibet, in Nepal, you know, you know, in Bhutan, you can see this tradition flourishing. And because, because of this tradition, and the Buddha's teaching you know, is kept and preserved so beautifully. Huh. So today, all over the world, there's no teachings that encompasses entire teaching of Buddha, like the teaching that we have preserved in the Himalayas today. Wow. So all over the world, even the most modern, famous scientists are after this. And, uh, so this is a sought after, so like a treasure that we have, which we are protecting and preserving because of the many reincarnated masters who are born one after another mm -hmm. and continue this tradition. And and you were you, you were chosen when you were very young, four. When yes, you were four? I was, and I was told that this in a, in a boy is special or some yeah, kind of yeah, things. Yeah, but yeah. you know, <laughs> and and then of course you 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 started studying and you, you how do I say it? Um, I don't I don't know if I can use this term or not. The you 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 were trained. Trained. Yeah, you trained. were trained from a very young age. A very young age, you know, uh, first by my grandparents and yeah. parents and yeah. then our tutors and teachers then we were trained in philosophy colleges then we were trained by our masters you know yeah. in a secret you know yeah. tradition by receiving empowerments and transmissions yeah. then we practice ourselves meditation and sadhanas so this is a very very rigorous uh, training that uh, we have to take yeah. you know to be able to truly deliver yeah. the teaching and did you do all, did you do all the trainings in Nepal itself? No, Nepal and India and Tibet, and uh, also Bhutan and you know, as well. You know, as, there was a special term of yoga that I was reading. At Ati at, 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 yoga. Ati yoga, if yes. I'm not mistaken. Yes. Is it a self? Uh, is it is it a part of meditation? Is it part of yoga that uh, you were you were training for for the last two three decades? Yes, uh, we and uh, have this tradition called nine yana. Okay, what is that? Nine yana means nine level of path. So, eighth level and, uh, is general common and a practice that has to do with mind. And the ninth level has to do with wisdom, going beyond mind. So, Enlightenment. Ati Yoga is going beyond mind. So, it's like a pinnacle of all the teachings of Buddha. So, today, of course, yeah, uh, Ati Yoga is what everyone is and are trying to really and uh, connect with uh -huh. and for that you need a great lineage teacher and uh, so us who receive transmissions and empowerment we carry the lineage yeah. so the lineage blessing and empowerment required to be able to truly experience the essence of ati yoga how long did it take you? Forever? All your life? Uh, it still will take me a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I'm willing to let it take forever. <laughs> forever and ever? Yeah. Oh, wow, 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 wow. 
Uh, when was the first time you met uh, Dalai Lama, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, I think uh, maybe 40 years ago. 40 years ago? Or maybe even more. Yeah, what? Even, even longer, yeah. 40 I, years? I'm a very old man. <laughs> no, you don't look old at all. You look like you're in your like, 40s. Yeah. You do look like, I thought you were in your 40s when the first Th- time I you, met you, you at the lounge. I, I have to buy you a coffee <laughs> <laughs> after this. <laughs> uh, how, how was meeting him for the first time, if you don't mind me asking? How, how, how is he in person? Oh, you know, very gentle person and a very kind person. And uh, uh, lots of wisdom, and I, you know, it's very hard to describe. I mean, it's like, a, you know, I, you know, practically and a great masters, and I met, you know, all of them yeah. are like, you know, someone who embodied this compassion and peace, and and where you receive this warmth, where you feel that you are empowered, where you feel that you can relate. Yeah. So, including my own root guru. His Holiness Chattel Rinpoche, and uh, who lived in Parping, and uh, for entire life, uh-huh. and uh, it's like an amazing, amazing individual who never compromised, uh-huh. even for a moment, in living life fully. Uh-huh. So the great masters are like that. So really, I think uh, no different. You know, all the great masters, they really relate to you in a way. You are inspired to live your life in a meaningful way. Do you think uh, young friends now? Uh, I'm not. I'm not going to put you in the spot. But uh, do you think friends now who were born in the 2000s, who are probably being born now in the coming years, do you think they'll be able to go out and relate to spirituality? Do you think they're going to be able to go out and relate to? Um, Meditation? Do you think they're going to be able to go out and relate and have time uh, to devote towards getting to know themselves better in this fast-moving age? Uh, you see, I think you know everything is possible, but I think uh, most important thing is us, like a teachers, yeah. do have responsibility to bring clarity and able to explain in a way that they can understand. You know, it's just a matter of you know, having opportunity to truly find the essence of meditation and essence of spirituality in a way they can comprehend, in a way they can embrace, in a way they can understand. I was uh, in uh, Necker Island in British Virgin Island. So Richard Branson's island. Uh, uh, Richard Branson's island. And I was there as a speaker to the blockchain annual conference with the uh, and a multi-billionaires, they all are there, and they asked me to come and speak. And then many of the billionaires, you know, their lifestyle is very crazy, but they wanted to learn, and they wanted to receive teachings from me. And some of them I did give teachings, one hour personally, and as well. And then Richard Branson himself yeah. requested and me to you know, say a few words to him, and because he said he tried to meditate for so long, and he always failed. I said, maybe something's wrong. You know? so, <laughs> so I explained to him for an hour and 15 minutes alone, and he listened 100% attentively, and now he's meditating. Wow. So I think it's just a matter of being able to explain meditation in a way that you will find it's very easy to meditate. It's very natural to meditate, uh-huh. very meaningful to meditate. So I think uh, it's, you know we have responsibility as a teacher and as speakers to guide everyone in a way is beneficial for them. So I think if we have many good teachers in the future for millennials and Gen Z, I'm sure uh, there's no difference you know, between those and elder generation and people because <laughs> many of elder generations they also probably never had very good and a teacher who explained them clearly either. So, but they may sure. have wasted a lot of time and lives too. So I think it depends on us. I think, therefore, I think we have a great responsibility to truly explain and lucidate in a way yeah. they can really, you know, find it's very easy to understand. I, I agree. And, you know, the older I get, the older I get, the more I start valuing my time here. 
I always thought that uh, I have less time. I do not have time anymore. I have very, very less time in this world. But uh, now I've come to realize that I have a lot of time left. I have a lot of time left to do a lot of important things. Like you said, you know, every breath mm -hmm. matters. Right. I do have a lot of time, and how am I going to go ahead and uh, maximize that time and uh, be valuable uh, to the society in that time? Uh, how important is time, and how would you want to elaborate time if uh, we had to talk about uh, a specific moment in our mm -hmm. life? How would you want to elaborate time, and what do you like to say to young people with time? Well, I think most important for us is to make sure we don't take anything for granted. So as long as we don't take our life for granted, we have plenty of time. So uh, it's a matter of you know, you know, realizing how to utilize what we have and how to really experience abundance instead of having a poverty mentality. And as far as I'm concerned, there's no need to have any poverty mentality as far as time is concerned, as far as environment is concerned, mm -hmm. because we have everything here that is perfect if we are able to embrace it as it is. So in a way, you know, I think today, if anything is wrong for anybody and everybody, is that we distract ourselves too much. A distraction is there for us, and we allow these things to distract us. Yeah. So when we allow these things to distract us, we take our life for granted, and uh, we waste our time. So it's not that we don't have time. It's not that we are not capable of really, you know, seizing the moment, so to speak. But it is not realizing that, that if we are distracting, we are not mindful. Actually, there is nothing much that we can do, you know, and do need to do, yeah. as long as we are not distracted. And non-distraction you know, is the key to truly... Find time to do whatever you want to do because in that non-distracted moment, mm -hmm. I think you can accomplish everything. How do we get to that is the catch. That's right. So I think it's not so difficult in a way because you know, as a human being, we realize our life is precious. So once we realize our life is precious, we realize all lives are precious. So once we realize life is precious, then we also realize this is not forever. Yeah. In a human life or animal lives, or whatever lives we you know, talk about, it's not forever. There is impermanence, right? Yeah. Uh, change is taking constantly. Then we realize, oh, there is a certainty of death because there is certainty that this body will be disintegrated. So therefore, whatever it is, if we attach to something, if we condition too much, we're going to create karma that we will have to pay the price, so to speak. So I think, in a way, it's very logistic, uh, uh, logical, very logical to you know, really relate because this is very scientific in a way because yeah. uh, there's nothing that uh, we can understand. To be able to seize the moment, we have to, of course, realize how wonderful it is that we are alive, how wonderful it is that we are able to really experience this heart of ours, which is full of peace and compassion. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's no one that cannot fit in your heart, if you really think about it. And your heart is as big as the space, yeah. because it is not conditional, it's unconditional. True. So in that sense, I think we will find a very much opportunity to enjoy and relate to everyone and take everyone as your you know, support or somebody to relate to. and. Uh, and so we find many, many opportunities to truly you know, take this journey uh, in a way, you know, completely so sort of like dancing all the way and with our brothers and sisters around the world. I wish, I wish that everybody thought the way you did. <laughs> You've met the leaders of uh, our country, I'm sure you have. You've yes. met the leaders of various different countries as well. <coughs> uh, how can we make, how can we make, uh, Nepal uh, better, not trying to again put you in the spot um, I'll come to brand Nepal, I'll come to how can we take Nepal to the map uh, internationally, globally right. we just talked about Davos earlier 
uh, when it comes to leaders as well, you know, what do you like to go ahead and say to leaders of our country and around the world as well? Any 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 po- any steps, any points that you'd like to give them that yeah. they could make things better, yeah. enhance their yeah. skills, maybe? No, I think all leaders must understand that you are not a leader forever. So therefore, when you have opportunity, you know, it is your responsibility to the make most out of it. The way to make most out of it is not for self-serving you know, benefits that you take. If you are a real leader, it is very important to serve people who voted you to become a leader because they expect you to really shine. And this is your opportunity to be the best that you can be. Yeah. So I would like to say to a leader, always remember that you are not on that chair forever and you are voted and uh, you are voted by the people who really cares about you, who loves you and who expects you to do something good. So when, once you get the opportunity, don't miss it. Don't miss it <laughs> and uh, take the opportunity to make most out of it by serving your people and serving your country. And that is the way you can serve yourself. Uh, here it seems like first they try to go ahead and serve themselves and then try to go ahead and serve everybody else. And uh, I believe that's the approach which is going to be, which is wrong, I guess. No, I think if you want to serve yourself, and the best way to serve yourself is not to attach to yourself in a conditional way. So if you want to serve yourself, find out your true essence, which is you have unconditional heart, which is you have you know, like an inexhaustible wisdom. So with having that compassion and wisdom, if you are trying to serve yourself, should be fine because you will not be conditioning everything for yourself because you will be able to realize that you are no different from other, others are no different from you. In that sense, I think you can be a great leader because at the end of the day, great leaders are here to serve their constituents, right? Yeah. And they they are to serve by being themselves in the history book. Would you want to give somebody's example here? Would you want to name somebody? Anybody who comes to your mind as a great leader? Who should be a great leader? Well, a great leader like uh, Mahatma Gandhi uh, was a great leader. I mean, the way he even uh, wore his, uh, you know, dhoti, you know, kurda, right? So how he was able to show his, you know, like a um, role yeah. to the people. I think that's very uh, admirable because you can say he has his own agenda, whatever. People can say whatever they want to say, but I think that becomes a symbol of leader. Yeah. So I think that's very good. And and, and recently as in Nelson Mandela, for instance. Exactly, exactly. Know, was coming there. Yeah. You know, he did uh, sacrifice a lot and he was able to truly uh, do something by being in the jail himself. Exactly, sacrifice his life. Sacrifice his life. His time. But yeah. at, and at the same time, he was smiling even in the jail, because in, uh, he cannot afford to get mad and get angry, then he will be gone in the jail, right? Yeah. So I think that is the self-serving, because if it's not self-serving, he will be really fighting in the jail. Instead, he was smiling and he was, you know, recalculating everything, and then he was able to, you know, serve humanity. And yeah. now he is remembered by everyone. Yeah. So I think we, our Nepali leaders, have same opportunity. I really would like to see them rise to the occasion. Oh, wow. Well, I haven't seen his picture for a long, long time. Well, there you go. Well, uh, there you go. Uh, we constantly talk about karma here, uh, your eminence. And uh, if you do good, good things are going to happen to you. <coughs> if you do bad, bad things are going to happen to you. We've been saying that a lot. How true is it? Honestly. <laughs> no, I think when you, when you do good, yeah. what that means is like if you don't condition... Yeah. If you are able to remain unconditionally, you will not suffer. So if you are conditioning everything, you know, if conditional things are not manageable, conditional things are, in, uh, conditional things are exhaustible. So what that means is when conditional things uh, disappear, you suffer. For instance, you make a sand castle yeah. on a beach, Right. So since you are not aware that waves are going to come any moment, so when waves hit your sand castle, you are sad because that's the karma, because not knowingly you created a sand castle, not knowingly the waves came, 
then your sandcastle was destroyed, right? Yeah. So because that's conditioning. Yeah. So it's a very true. Karma, I think we have to believe in karma, not in a saying, okay, I'm going to smile, so everybody is going to smile at me. <laughs> not, not just like that. That is also possible. <laughs> but I think we have to think much more that uh, even our thoughts, and if you condition any of our energy, it becomes thought. And when it becomes thought, it can seduce us or it can trap us. In, 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 uh, entangle us, right? Mm. So when energy is uh, remain naturally, it is not conditioned, it cannot be formed as thought or feelings or emotions or anything. Mm. So in that way, it is very important for us to truly tackle everything by believing in the law of karma. If only, if only we could shut down our brain for a second, you know, which, uh, again, I, I, I can talk about myself because I have a brain, right? It was back in the day, it was always on, going on and on and on and on, always constantly thinking about the next thing or the new thing or what I want to do next constantly. But now, obviously, you know, I've, I've, I kind of can channelize on things and take it. If I want it, I want, I can make it go slightly slower. But always, of course, that's one problem that I deal with as well, constantly moving <clears> on towards the next thing. You know, maybe consistency and maybe speed and maybe something that I always constantly want to do is some, that gets me going every single day. It doesn't work like that for everybody else because I believe every human being is different. They have their own pace. They have their own style. They have their own way of doing things, you know. What would be a good approach according to you? Not just for me, but for everybody else. So I would say mind of a mirror. So like uh, in the mirror, yeah. you know, like uh, you see... And uh, there's potential for all kinds of reflections. So in the mirror, uh, many things can reflect, many things can disappear, right? Constantly, it's like a mind. A mind is constantly, there's a flow of energy, yeah. right? So similarly, in the mirror, constantly things can reflect. And also, sometimes nothing reflects. But that's also fine because that doesn't mean mirrors potential to reflect diminishes at all. So in that sense, when you look at the mirror, the mirror, whatever reflects in it. Uh -huh. And there's nothing that mirror is desiring to really hold on to, say, ah, oh, yes, Sanjay, you are good looking. Yeah. So I want you to be always you know, in front of me. Yeah. Mirror never says to you, right? Uh, and uh, Sanjay, I miss you because your beautiful face is not, <laughs> the mirror doesn't say that. <laughs> so in a way, I think if we do not um, so like uh, interfere in everything that is coming, you know, in our mind, you know, no matter what is coming. So I think if you take one uh, thing at a time, should be you know, very good because uh, in that way, again, coming back to the point that you find validity in that very moment, uh, whatever is, you know, coming and whatever is going, whether it's coming or not coming, yeah. whether it's going or not going. And if you are able to see that, maybe you're not going to fall into extremes. Oh, well, hopefully not. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of, uh, there's a, I was talking to a few friends of mine yesterday and uh, a few doctors, friends of mine, and then they were trying to tell me that there's a lot of depression and a lot of anxiety within our country. Right. Uh, of course, we have to think about the basic things as well here, mm -hmm. from roads to lights to water to the basic necessities. We also have to think about that right. on top of everything else. Right. So there is some kind of uh, depression and some kind of anxiety always rolling and always in our brain somewhere or the other. Right. Um, trying to channelize that, try to, trying, to, trying to navigate your way through all of that. Any suggestion you'd like to go ahead and give to people who are listening to us right now? No, I think, uh, you know, as a human being, we try to survive. Yeah. You know, constantly we try to survive. And I feel that uh, we are re very resourceful, you know, always, no matter where we are. So I think it's very important for us to try to cope with you know, whatever situation we are in. I think we can dream about uh, much bigger and better and more beautiful and so on and so forth. So it's like a fantasizing in a way. Yeah. It's not practical, right? So practically, whatever you have, try to manage it. And most importantly, and, uh, not to depend on anything, yeah. you know, including external 
you know, comfort or including your own emotions or including your own thoughts or philosophy or dogma, whatever it is. Yeah. Rather try to remain independent and you know, constantly and you know, continuously because I think we have potential to be liberated in the moment without having to depend on anything. So I think once we realize that, I think we can manage everything as it comes because, you know, worse, you know, you saw in the COVID pandemic time and everybody is locked inside the house, but yeah. still, you know, that was quite precious because we're still safe and alive, Yeah. right? So I think uh, in a way, it's very important for us to really be practical and try to take whatever we have in front of us and make most out of it instead of fantasizing, and which really brings depression and really brings anxiety and mental problem and so on and so forth. I think human beings, so what we have is being able to breathe and yeah. breathe freely. Yeah. So also always remember that it is us who are projecting. It is our mind we are projecting. So we have capability to also not to project. Oh, yeah, that that is, that, yeah, that, that is so true as well. Uh, brand Nepal. Nepal is a brand. That's the same thing that we were talking on right. the plane as right. well, right? And uh, <clears throat> that's the most important thing. And uh, you try to go ahead and brand. You're trying to brand the country as well. When you think about it, you know, you're taking the country's name outside this, uh, the country and uh, trying to promote the country itself, right. you know. Uh, where do we lack, if you had to talk a little bit about that, and... Where do you think our uh, key factors are to make sure that we brand ourselves faster uh, in a in a fast speed? You know, where do we lack and where can we make things better? What do, What do you think? I think uh, what we really need to do is we need to realize that in Nepal we have everything: uh, the best weather, best environment, and a you know, best everything. And you can think, I've traveled all over the world. You know, yeah, I just, yeah. I really, when I was asked to come to become the keynote speaker of this and participate in this conference and so on and so forth, and they're going to, you know, do everything for me to help, you know, you know, be part of this, you know, team and part of this. And many of the times, I really don't want to go because it's just like, <laughs> it's just perfect here. Where do I need to go? Yeah, you're happy where you're at. Where I'm happy where I am. And in Nepal is the most beautiful weather and most beautiful people. Everything is perfect here. But when I go there, I try to do something and try to help you know, people who are requesting me to help them. Excuse me. No problem. At the same time, I have opportunity to really share Nepal around the world. And I try to tell people that you, know, you should come to Nepal because this is where you're going to experience life transformation. Because I think this is a power place. This is a place where you can be yourself in a way that nature is going to empower you. So when I say like this, people are able to truly understand. You know, because and I, I compare to wherever they are. You know, I've been yeah. to most beautiful places and uh, most rugged places and uh, more you know, developed places and you know, whatever. I see that there is something lacking in those places because... They cannot relate to themselves. Here in Nepal, uh, you know, we have, you know, you know uh, think about this, Mount Everest, you know, to Mount Kailash, you know, to Pashupati Nath, to Bauda Nath, to Lumbini, to and everything you can share in addition to our civilization, True. in addition to our history, in addition to what we are able to truly, you know, do and say. And, and today, look, you know, you and I are conversing in English, you know. So I think... Uh, probably in London or you know, you know, uh, America, yeah, yeah. they can really understand what we're talking about. You know? true, this true, is Nepal, true. and it's happening yeah. in Nepal. So uh, it's not a BBC or CNN, but this is not anything less. It's Kathmandu. <laughs> yeah, this is not anything less. So yeah. I think in that way, I think we have so much to share. And what we really need to do is we need to have confidence in our resources, our people, and our ability. And we need to show this around the world. And which I tell our you know, NRN leaders as well, because I try to you know, sh share with them that I have written a script, a musical play on the story of Maya Devi and uh, about the unconditional love. I said, I'm going to share this with everyone all over the world. So all our Nepalese brothers and sisters, the Himalayan brothers and sisters, 
they can come and they can present themselves to the world. Yeah. Because we have something to share to the world, because we can be proud of ourselves. We can be confident in our history. We can be confident in our philosophy, our spiritual way of being, so that these people are looking for this. So I think it's not out of arrogance we are bringing there, out of compassion, if we bring yeah. this to them. I think uh, they will be able to embrace it, and we will be able to really share something on the global stage. I think there is nothing anybody else can provide, but we can provide. Uh, no, and you're 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 practically doing that, and I'm, I'm and in I'm a small way. <laughs> well, you're being modest right now. Uh, you you were just sharing with me that you're going to uh, New York Fashion Week. Can I can I mention that? Ah, uh, sure, sure. <laughs> yeah. uh, X, just find out when New York Fashion Week is. February. Uh, uh, February nine to twelve. You going? Uh, yeah, almost the, fixed. Everything fixed. No, there's a uh, Fashion Week owners. Uh, they realize that uh, make peace more fashionable than war. Yeah. Uh, my mantra and uh, destination for all peace lovers uh, in Lumbini, this in uh, vision, they really uh, align with our vision and they think this is exactly what we need today. Yeah. And uh, of course, you know, they have fashion show, but uh, it's not just externally, they have to be fashionable. I think they have to be fashionable internally uh, to align with the goodness of a you know, human being, yeah. human nature, right? So I think... Uh, they are very excited, and uh, they requested me to come, and they want to do everything they can to promote peace and, uh, you know, help us, you know, promote our peace project, you know. So I'm looking forward to going. It's a little cold. I came from Davos, which is very cold, <laughs> very and cold. now I'm going to go back to another cold place. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wish you the best of luck, and I really hope that you have a very fruitful uh, trip uh, to New York. And uh, I know what you're trying to do. You're trying to definitely go ahead. And wherever you go, Nepal is being promoted. And that is the most important thing for yes. me. For me, everything else is secondary. Uh, the country uh, being promoted is primary, and no shadow of a doubt on uh, that any single day. And what you're doing, it's very, very important. And I'm glad that you're doing that. And Nepal is worth promoting. And it's truly, and Nepal is worth promoting. And peace is worth promoting. I think we have something very special to share on the global stage. Yeah. And uh, I'm very happy to play my small role in whatever way I can until my last breath. Oh, 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 oh. I'm, enti- I'm, I'm so glad, I'm so glad that you're here. And thank you so much for coming. And uh, to all the, all the friends who are listening right now, young and old, anything that you'd like to go ahead and share with them, anything at all that you feel like? Yes, I would like to share that. Uh, and I would like to invite everyone yeah. to become the stakeholder of this universal peace you know, movement. Because uh, I would like everybody to feel the ownership of this. Yeah. Because peace is your birthright, as well as peace is your responsibility. If you want to have a meaningful life, if you want to find true purpose in your life, I think it's very important for you to embrace peace and make peace priority in your life. So to make peace more fashionable is our responsibility. So everybody, whatever way you, know, you would like to involve, I would like you to relate to us with your creativity. And very simple, if you visit peacesanctuary.org, yeah. which is our uh, website, peacesanctuary.org, you can find so many ways to you to participate. We would like your guidance. You would like your advice. It's right we, there. Yeah, we would like your <coughs> participation in whatever way you can. So this is the, there's a video, <coughs> there's a design, everything and uh, people can relate to. Yeah. And most importantly, I feel that to find inner peace is the purpose of your life. By finding inner peace, you will be able to contribute to world peace. And that is the way for you to shine. And I would like everybody to take this opportunity and join me on this journey together. And we all can accomplish this together. And peace must be everyone's responsibility. So that's why I'm traveling all over the world to let everybody know that, look, we have responsibility and we have to take the journey together and we have to co-create this universal peace destination. So I'm making it a movement. It is becoming a movement now and everybody is embracing it. And I thank you for having me here and I'm very happy to share this uh, message with 
your audience as well. And we're and glad. Wishing, we're wishing you the very best. We're glad, and you're here, and uh, again, we're really happy that you're here. And uh, any way we can help out some more with this, let me know and let us know, and I'll, I'd love to be one of the first ones to come over. Yes, please join as a peace ambassador. And uh, really, it is our honor to have you 100%. as in our team. Actually, 100%. recently we had a gala dinner here, and we had 240 peacekeepers who joined as a lifetime member. First ever gala on red carpet in Kathmandu was the most successful for peace. And I think we started from here, and this is what I'm telling everywhere. So we are a small country, we are humble people, but we are doing our best. No doubt. Yeah. Uh, count me in. We're in, we're in, we're in. Anything with peace, I mean. Thank you. Thank you so much, yeah, Thank, I mean, you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, my God. Thank you so much. If you love what we are doing, make sure that you subscribe and turn on notifications. This program is brought to you by Vyas Studios.